Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you here again. I'm Shauna Gilroy, the 2020 Chair of the Vallejo Chamber of Commerce. Welcome back to our Wednesdays with Women. This is the third in a series of our Women in Business Seminar. I'm recognizing National Women's Small Business Month. We are fortunate enough to have great sponsors and a great committee that worked on this event. And we are so glad that you could join us today. A quick shout out to our sponsors, Medic Ambulance, who was a series sponsor. Toro University of California, Crystal Properties, and Vallejo Insurance Associates. Thank you so much. Um, all of you guys were able to make it free for all of our attendees to come today and hear all of these great seminars. Um, also, I want to say thank you to the Committee of Hardworking Women um, that really put a lot of time and effort into bringing this all together. Um, that includes Helen Pearson of Medic Ambulance, Jana Modina of Assemblymember Timothy Grayson's office, Tina Fowler with the Vallejo Chamber, um, myself, Jean Kilkenny Turk of the Vallejo Chamber, Josette Lacey from Solano County Supervisor District 1, Erin Hannigan's office, Gina Snyder Consultant, Annette Taylor with the City of De Vallejo, sorry, and Andrea Garcia of Toro University, California. Thank you again to all of our committee and to our sponsor. Um, with us today, we have our moderator, Ms. Josette Lacey. Again, she's with um, Solano County Supervisor District 1, Erin Hannigan's office. Thank you so much for being with us today, Josette. Um, and our facilitator today for this communications webinar, we are very happy to have her, Andrea Garcia, the Vice President of Advancement for Toro University, California. Thank you all for being here. Andrea, take it away. Thank you. And thank you all so much for being here as well. Uh, as Shauna said, I'm Andrea Garcia, Toro University, California. But um, today I'm wearing our cap for women in business. I can't tell you how excited I am. We have two fantastic women here and I wanna read you their bios and we were kind of joking about this that it's a little bit long, but they are accomplished and I'm not cutting any of it out. So bear with me, I'll try to read as fast as I can. So we have Teresa Mears. She has 20 years of law enforcement experience and is a retired patrol sergeant with the St. John's County Sheriff's Office. She has a bachelor's degree in criminal justice with a minor in psychology, a master's degree in public administration, and over 300 hours of advanced management training. She is the founder of TM Consulting, where she assists organizations and businesses in the development and execution of growth and multi-level project strategies. These strategies focus on delivering exceptional presentation, execution, and management of initiatives. Are you feeling uncomfortable yet? <laughs> Inspired by her 20 years, okay, okay, I'll cut a little bit more. She is on the Business Journal's list as a top woman-owned business in Northeast Florida. She was a recipient of the 2009 Jacksonville Business Journal's Women of Influence and the 2010 Entrepreneur of the Year for the North Florida Women in Business Awards. Okay, she's also the past president of the Women Business Owners of North Florida, past chair of the National Association of Women Business Owners, past chair for the NAWBO Institute, a foundation supporting women's education, and recently received an appointment on the International Steering Committee, I'm gonna try this, for Les Femmes Chef Entreprises, uh, an international association as the World Vice President, which represents 120 countries across five continents. That's amazing. So Teresa has a commitment to growing businesses and empowering other women business owners to navigate the challenging world of entrepreneurship. And this is why she's one of our panelists today. And then we have the magnificent Lindsay Mask, who is the founder of Ladies America, a national network of professional women connecting to advance one another personally and professionally, following the motto, women helping women. In 2016, Ladies America launched its first international effort under the organization's legal name of Ladies International Foundation by supporting an entrepreneurship project for women in Nepal. Now, this is very fascinating. We're, we're going to talk about this. In 2018, Lindsay spearheaded a two-day conference for over 100 aspiring female entrepreneurs in Zambia, Africa. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And ultimately launched a micro fund to sustain the efforts. Ladies America is currently negotiating an additional endeavor in Gambia, Africa. Lindsay is a senior or was a senior strategic communications specialist supporting the chief data officer of the United States Department of the Air Force. Before joining the Air Force team, she supported the US Department of Health and Human Services Office of National Security. 
She's also served as a spokesperson and communications expert for HHS Program Support Center and Federal Occupational Health, overseeing all internal and external communications, which reach an audience of 1.8 million federal employees. Prior to working to HHS, Lindsay established a boutique public relations and marketing firm, which was acquired by a Texas-based firm, then affording her the opportunity to focus solely on women's initiatives. So she was also, she began her career as a news anchor and reporter for ABC, a Michigan-based um, affiliate. And we just lost her. <laughs> she probably just went off uh, communication. So what do these both these women have? What they have in common is they have taken lead roles in women organizations and they have stepped up um, in the role of communications. And that's exactly what this um, webinar is about. Topic is women in business in the, under the umbrella of communications. So women have, um, all of us have our preferences, our styles, our values and communication approaches, very different than men which can sometimes make us feel less of value and unaccepted. So, we, so for example, we tend to minimize messages. Um, we'll say something like, oh, I'm really sorry. Do you have time for a meeting? Instead of being more forthright about it. And if we are forthright, sometimes we're said, you're being quite rude. So we have to find that balance. And so let me start with you, Teresa, since we can't find Lindsay. <laughs> Let's start with you. When we talk about this, we talk about the communications and you've had to deal with in the law enforcement being assertive that way, having that tough stance, I would guess, versus um, having a different conversation with other people. How do you deal with something like that? And how, how do you see that realm? How does that affect women? And especially for someone who is in an area that perhaps challenged women to be in, how, did, how do you, how, what can you talk about? in regards to that. So great, thank you so much, Andrea. Great introductions and thank you again for inviting me to participate in this. Um, you know, at a younger age, it was probably a little bit more difficult. The older I got, the more comfortable I became in communicating, but you're absolutely right. Uh, women try to do extra in order to deliver their message. They, they feel like they have to go above and beyond in order to just stay equal with the status quo. And, and it's very much a challenge. Um, the older you get, the more comfortable that you are in who you are and, and your characteristics as a leader or as a person, right? So it has that, that confidence level, that uh, being authentic, um, you know, being responsible for everything and, and then just having that empathy. Um, my nickname is Mama T, <laughs> Every, from law enforcement to um, entrepreneur, to my professional career, I'm always the mother, right? I always just tend to mother everyone. And, and it's interesting how that can play an effect. Um, but it's, you know, at the end of the day, you just have to feel comfortable with who you are, stay consistent on your messaging, and don't let it derail you. It's easier said than done when you're in your 50s or 60s, but when you're in your 20s and 30s, it's a little bit more hard to own that. And what I would say is, is definitely focus on finding a mentor. Find a woman who has gone through the trenches, who has experienced many things in life and, and is comfortable in her own skin and, and use that mentorship to help drive you through those challenges where you start to doubt yourself and doubt your message. There's, um, I was looking at your website and you have, this is what you write, leadership, no matter what your role or title or lack of thereof, is based on balance, the utilization of specific traits and being aware of emotions that drive us all. Mm -hmm. That seems to be associated with women. And that's something I wanted to talk about the emotion side. And so we can, if we pull that apart, some people will say, or men might say, and I don't want to say that, but oh, women, you know, they're just emotional. So how do you relate that when you we talk about being aware of the emotions that drive us all? So the two emotions are the fear and greed. I really go into how fear and greed drives us all. Fear that I'm not good enough. Fear that someone's going to judge me. And um, that's not what I mean. Um, and then greed of, 
why is this person getting more recognition than me? Why is this person getting promoted? Yay, welcome back, Lindsay. <laughs> um, you know, why is this person getting more than me? And sometimes we can let those thoughts and emotions drive our decision making. And that overrides our level of confidence and authenticity. And so what I talk about in those two emotions is recognize them, own them, but don't let them drive you. Don't let you make decisions based off of the two emotions that drive us all, which is being the fear and greed. Um, at the end of the day, just know who you are, stay confident, stay authentic, and just keep moving forward with the message that you have. As long as you're consistent, you're good to go. There are gonna be times that your message is not received well. There's gonna be times that men are gonna doubt you, degrade you, and there's gonna be times that women are gonna be um, you know, intimidated by you. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting minefield that we find ourselves in as women. I feel like we're having the right conversation these days. Um, I feel like we're being more upfront and honest about it. But at the end of the day, do not apologize for who you are. Do not apologize for what you want to accomplish because at the end of the day, that can be the difference between success and failure. Lindsay, um, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> you when when I when we departed for a moment, um, we were talking about you were anchor woman. You started with that. I let me ask you something about that. How hard was that um, coming onto that position? I, from what I understand, it's a very competitive field. Are you competing with other women? How how did you survive that? Um, well, first, I have to say, I, I love offering surprises. So um, I might just go on and off and I'll come back. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry about that. I like to keep life really interesting. Um, no, uh, it, interestingly, it was the men that became my biggest competitor. I was, um, I ended up being the 11 o'clock news anchor and there was a six o'clock and it was a male and he was he was very angry because the six o'clock typically gets more higher ratings and it was it was moving more in my direction and it became a vicious um feud I mean it was it was wild and then he assumed the um executive producer role as well for the station. And um, it really did complicate things. I felt like I, I got set up quite a few times and it, I mean, it was just, it was difficult. Um, where I found the hardest time with women, which is what actually pre precipitated the development of what started as Ladies Dinner Club was, and working in politics. Women in politics were brutal. I. The women in news, I, I didn't, I just didn't find it. I found that, that my competitors were with men and he would make comments about like how effeminate I was being next to me. He was like, oh my gosh, it's amazing. And he was like, don't touch the guests. You know, he was really angry. Um, but, but yeah, no, I think it was, it was actually the political space where I felt really the most challenged as well, because I, I, I didn't come from a family in politics. My mom wasn't the mayor somewhere. I, I, you know, I knew my parents voted. That was about it. They didn't know what I was talking about. And I just kind of felt like, you know, fresh, like meat in the water type of a thing. And, um, yeah, it became really complicated. In fact, I, worked in an all women office and um, it was, it was brutal. It was brutal. I, Cause I was selected for a, a magazine cause I was single in Austin, Texas. And they, I, it was a miracle. I mean, I was like super excited for about five seconds but they put me on the cover of the magazine. And I was like, wow, my gosh, the first cover of a magazine. And then I immediately thought, oh my gosh, I'm gonna get mutilated. The women in my office are gonna kill me. And um, that's a terrible feeling. I mean, it's just a, it's really a terrible feeling. And I couldn't figure out how to navigate that. I, it, I tried being extra nice, being very distant, being 
cold, being pushy. I tried everything. And um, one of the things that you and I spoke about was eventually I figured out there's sometimes you're not going to be able to change something. Uh, what you do is you build a new building and you go in it, right? Like get out, just get out. It's not worth the time. It, it, there's some people who are just always going to have an issue. Um, but one thing that's interesting because I was thinking about it today for some reason when I first came to DC they did a similar thing and I was brand new to DC and somebody nominated me for this Capitol Hill something and um, I had my picture taken and then I panicked I thought I'm not gonna I don't want to I don't want to attract negative attention from women I'm brand new here and this is like the big leagues you know I don't want to mess up here and I, I called the editor and I was like, can you please just remove me from, you know, from this thing? And it was a really big deal in the city. I mean, it was a really big deal. And the guy was like, you know, you're gonna be like blackballed forever if you do this. And I was like, I, was, I don't care. Like, it's just not worth it to me. But those were choices that I had to make. And it was on my drive actually from Austin to DC as I was like moving my whole life. And I really felt like, and I've got it. I can't fail here. Right. And um, I was thinking about it as if it was like a new year or a birthday, you know, it's a fresh start of some sort. And I, I was trying to process like, what do you, I, do I want to eat healthier? Do I want to exercise more? I drink more water, sleep more, you know, study more, read more books. But the one thing that, that kept coming up over and over is like, I, I want to figure out how to work with women. I I haven't figured it out. And I've tried to avoid them. I've tried to embrace them. And at the time, I just couldn't figure it out. And so I didn't know what the answer was. I can't even say I can pinpoint an exact answer now. I just know, I just knew that that was going to be my focus. And so my first two years in DC, which is one of the reasons I'm like, I don't, I don't want to be on a magazine. I don't want to be in a newspaper. I just want to focus on my relationships with women this is critical. We cannot continue down this path and be successful. We create a slippery slope. And I have come to believe that a lot of it is built off of fear. You know, it's a mama bear protective thing, right? Of your own space or your own work or your own progress. But the reality is rising tides do rise, raise all boats. And, and there is room enough for all of us, right? And, and so, you know, like I said, I, I eventually did build the new building and I was surrounded completely by women with that same mindset and um, motivation and desire for life and for our country and for women. And it was extraordinary. And it wasn't until years later that I was working back in like a presidential political campaign and I witnessed it again and I hadn't seen it. I was like, oh, I thought we were, I thought women were all done with this. Like, I didn't know we were still doing this because I just hadn't been around it for so many years. I didn't even realize it was still happening, but it is. And it very much still is. Um, it is a, it is a reality. Yes, there's better conversations. Yes, I do believe that women are supporting each other in a really unique way of um, shared experiences and things along those lines, which is extraordinary. And um, very meaningful, very powerful, and surprising to me, honestly. Like, at first, with the Me Too movement, I was like, I don't want to do this. This is the, I, this seems like a waste of time. Like, I want to talk about progress. I don't want to, I want to talk about all my bad memories of things that have happened, right? I didn't want to go there. But then as I did, I, I just, like, I was flooded, and I realized that they're really, truly, obviously, huge value in that as well. But, um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I don't like, again, I don't really have the answer. I just think that you have to um, pick the right people, believe that the right people are going to come around to you and, um, and just trudge forward. You know, what, uh, what Teresa was saying is just being yourself in every way. I, I often quote, I haven't quoted it in so long. I'm probably going to do it wrong, but E.E. E. Cummings, to be yourself in a world that is try, tries to, to change you, like, I don't know, I can't remember. It's the hardest battle you'll ever fight for the rest of your life. And it's the battle for a world that's constantly trying to morph you and change you into what it expects of you. Um, 
but for you to continue to be yourself is the battle, right? Like is the challenge and it's a beautiful challenge. It's not, it doesn't have to be a bad, like nightmarish one. It's a wonderful one for you to explore. Um, and it reminds me too, like a, it was like an Instagram post or something that I saw. And it was like, we accept you exactly how you are. And then the next thing was like, but not like that. <laughs> right. And that is that, right. It's like, Oh, come be who you are. Frozen. But then, but, but no, no, don't do yeah, it's, it's, um, I don't think it ever really ends. I think that, you know, this, this does continue. And, and, and you bring up too, something, right? you bring up a point, you know, if you look, people or women will accept you if you fit in that mold that they have for you. And I, and I've seen that happen, but then you have another group of friends who will accept you or someone who just who you are. And, you know, Josette and I were, were chatting about this earlier you know, for me, it's been this journey and seeing women in a different light. You know, there was, Joe, what that said, do you remember when he said to me, you get along better than with men than women? And I'm like, yeah, because I always felt like that was the case that I was always competing with a woman and whoever it was. And then I think, I don't know if it's a journey that has taken me to, um, to this point here where I am today, where now I just look at, um, there you are. I just look at um, women and just, I don't know if it's opening up that door and seeing a different space, but appreciating everyone for who they are. And I think, you know, Lindsay, you and I talked about this also when we first chatted, it's confidence. It's finding that confidence within yourself, accepting you for who you are, accepting you for who you are. And then once you've done that, I, I think this whole different world opens up, which is just fantastic, you know, and right. And we ha can have those communications and we can work together and we don't compete with one another. We're happy for other people's successes, not jealous of their successes. You know, we, we take them by their hand and we're like, yeah, let's go. Okay, Teresa, you're on. <laughs> I saw your face. <laughs> go for it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, that all sounds good in theory. But at the end of the day, that's not reality. And we know that. Um, I'm trying to, um, I don't, her name is not coming to me, but one of my um, favorite books is called Tripping the Prom Queen. And and so that the title in of itself, right? The title in of itself um, speaks volumes. And it talks about, it's almost like a biological response I even believe Harvard has done a survey and a study on how women will compete more with each other than try to compete with men. Because, you know, like Ruth Ginsburg, right? She was talking about um, having an all women on the Supreme Court and everybody was like, huh? But she's like, well, wait a minute. You didn't question it when it was all men. Mm -hmm. And so when you're a woman and you're excelling in a masculine world, it's almost like a little bit of an extra shiny trophy. But when you have to share that spotlight and that shiny trophy with another female, it's like our biological response takes over and we almost want to be like the one, right? We don't want other women if there is a male dominated world because we want to shine as that special woman that was successful as a woman, but it's successful as a woman in a man's world. And so that's why we find ourselves wanting to trip the prom queen is because we don't want that competition. We would rather compete and shine as our own woman in a man's world versus competing with another woman. Very rarely do they reach back and lift other women up. That's exactly what Navo represents. You know, Navo was talking about you reach back, you build leaders, and then you reach back and you drag and pull and support those women that need to continue to move forward with you. And you build your own table and you invite women to come to it. But you also invite men because it can't be just women. It can't be just men. It has to be both at the, at the table having the conversation. So yeah, in, in theory, it's absolutely amazing. And I have, I count myself very, very lucky. I have probably a good 10 to 12 women that we all celebrate each other, 
successes, right? But but I probably could count 80 to 100 women that would be like, oh, that's so wonderful. I want to be better than you. And that's just reality. Sometimes we competed against each other and hold each other back more so than what a men's world would do to ourselves. So do you feel that you compete with other women? Where I'm at now, no. <laughs> <laughs> where, yeah, I mean, where I have gotten myself and my career, I am responsible for lifting other women up. And, and I do it so easily. Um, you know, there is a, a woman that I work with. Um, she, I have a few mentors, our uh, mentees that I mentee that want to become, um, you know, grow in their career and they want to advance in what they're doing. And so I mentor them and that I'm also a part of an organization where I can help support women. And what I get is, oh my God, thank you so much. Other women don't do this for me. Thank you so much. I don't hesitate to do that. So in my world, I felt like I've conquered and accomplished so much that it's almost my responsibility to look back and uplift other women. However, I do have a lot of women that I love dearly that do compete with other women. It's, it's a fact. I mean, so I'm happy that I don't feel those emotions. I'm sure probably at 20 years old, I did at some point in time where I wanted to be the only girl on the SWAT team. I wanted to be the only girl that shot the perfect score. You know, I wanted to be the only woman that had, you know, reached X amount of million dollars in my sales and revenue a year. Sure. That part of it, you definitely want to shine, but it didn't drive my decision-making and it didn't drive my relationships. Can you talk a little bit about your organization? Um, well, the NABA, what you belong to, and how did you get involved with that? Uh, you know, so when I, I did come from law enforcement and I went into, um, you know, women business organization here locally, my business was more national. So I had a little bit, you know, more of a national reach than a local. So I was looking for something that could support me nationally. And that's when I came across the National Association of Women Business Owners. And I had gotten so much from our local organization and the fact that, you know, these women were coming up to me and they were hugging me and they were smiling and they were welcoming me. And I was thinking, what do you want? You know, I mean, especially coming from law enforcement, you're like, okay, six feet back, don't touch me, <laughs> don't hug me, what do you want? Uh, so they taught me how to be a woman. I'll never forget one of the members coming up to me and going, Teresa, do you do know that they make more colors than brown and black, right? I was like, all I did, I woke up and I wore spruce green polyester. I didn't have to worry about matching. So it was easy for me to wear black and brown. And she was like, you know, they make other colors, right? And so they helped me <laughs> become a woman. And I craved that probably at a larger level, just because of my competitiveness and just wanting to achieve. And, and so I applied to be a part of the national board um, uh, became accepted. And then I just found this amazing sisterhood that to this day, um, I have relationships and communication with those women that I've met across not only the nation, but the world. Yeah. So it's, it's an amazing support system. And I probably wouldn't be here in Spain if I did not have that to support me. But um, we celebrated our um, 40th year, 45th year. Um, at, we started in 1975. And it started in DC and we have grown, um, you know, thousands of members and 60 plus chapters across the US. And we're, we're there for women, especially now in the COVID era where some of the women find their doors shut, we're there to help them and support them. Um, even if it just means showing up and giving them a box of tissue. Thank you, Teresa. So I'm gonna, um, we have a question in the chat and I want all of our attendees to know that it's a good time to send questions through your Q&A and I will read those um, so that the panelists can give an answer. So we have a question from Susan. New leadership concepts are encouraging leaders to be vulnerable, to have the courage to be vulnerable. Well, heck, women have always been vulnerable, so not so new to us. However, we have been called weak for being vulnerable. Just interesting how our perceived trait is now a leadership concept. Lindsay? Yeah, um, it, what it's making me think of, and this is years ago, so I don't know what the new data is, but 
the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Center for Women in Business years ago partnered with Catalyst, and they did a study on women in middle management. And there were, so it's like women were advancing, but they weren't getting really past middle management. But then they like analyzed middle management and they had extraordinarily high retention rates, right? Because I think because the natural tendency of women is, is to um, check in with the employees, right? With staff. Are you doing okay? Do you, you need anything, right? Like just general care and concern. And it was saving companies millions upon millions of dollars in, you know, finding new employees, training new employees, just all, all the things that go with high turnover rates. And so it, it's a, uh, it's a real, I mean, it's a real impact. And I was just so astounded when I started reading this research and I was like, this is what I've been saying, right? Like, this is why we need balance. Again, to Teresa's point, we always made sure we weren't talking about women taking over the world. I said, I think we're going to, if people aren't paying attention, but I don't think that we should. I think that we're working really hard and it, you know, we're on a really fast trajectory. However, we need balance. We need these different characteristics that are very natural to both men and women in um, leadership, in political leadership, in business leadership across the board. And um, that for me was such an extraordinary example of why, right? Like it seemed like a small thing, but when you're looking at a Fortune 50 company and you're looking at incredibly high retention rates, I mean, that is moving a needle, millions and millions and millions of dollars. It's impacting the stock market. These aren't small things. These are really big things. And so that is the case for women to be at higher and higher levels in leadership. Um, just that one piece. And there's uh, so many, right? Like that's one piece of research that I thought supports exactly that. Teresa, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think she said it well. I think the only thing I would add is um, I, I like to celebrate women, but we need to stop celebrating it as, oh my God, the woman that did this, right? We need to just go no more, <laughs> you know, um, because we're making it unique in it of itself and it shouldn't be unique. It should be just common and accepted. I, you know, it doesn't mean I don't want to celebrate women, but we shouldn't act like it was something like rare and unexpected and oh my gosh we should be saying there needs to be more um and, and making sure that it's the right women i don't want it to be a woman just because it's a woman it needs to be the right woman but i i just think we need to kind of rein back the first woman or the woman because it just kind of really it creates that shining star where we just need to go more women right congratulations how can we get more so that's a good point I didn't look at it that way, but that's a really good perspective. So when you're talking about that, are you including men in there as well? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about doing the job, um, but women need to really focus on supporting women. And if women have a seat at the table, they have absolutely have to not be jealous of the spotlight. They need to turn around and say, yep. what other women can I bring to this table? That's such an important point because I find and I've seen that when you do have those successes or someone is there that you you find people who are just say that smile, that fake smile, yeah, that's great, but you know inside that's not really what they're feeling. But right. but I will say when other women have successes, I am sincerely happy for them. You know, I don't and I think a lot is again that journey. You know, so mm -hmm. I don't think that happens with every woman, but I think it does happen eventually we get there to that point. Um, Lindsay, can you talk about the organization that you founded? Yeah, but you're reminding me of the story that I shared with you um, on our prep call. And it was a day where there was a, a gore, I mean, just this gorgeous woman who I had done a couple projects with, I'd been introduced to through a friend in New York City, and she was in LA, and she had this young women's organization and she's just all over the place and Michelle Obama invited her to the White House and like complimented on her on her combat boots or something I mean like she just always had these great stories and she was everywhere and I remember like 
just waking up one morning and like looking at social media and seeing some other some other thing that she was awarded or she was being profiled or something and I was like oh my gosh they like I did feel it even despite all the years of you know let's women helping women, right? You still, I mean, it's human nature. It still feels like, God, really? Like there's other people working here. <laughs> and um, I checked myself though. I, I, I realized what I was feeling and I thought, wow, I don't want to feel like this. I only feel like this because she's amazing, right? And so I made the decision to, instead of just let that fester, I just reached out to her and I was like, listen, I can't tell you, I am so jealous. I think you're absolutely amazing. Congratulations, but I'm also jealous. And it was such a, it like relieved me of the feeling and her response just lit me up. Like it was so great. She said, oh my gosh, I was just telling our mutual friend how amazing you are. And I just like, and I was like, really? Like she thinks I'm amazing. I think she's amazing. You know, and we just wouldn't have been able to even have that conversation if I had let that get the best of me. So I think it's okay. I mean, we are human and we, especially when you're working hard and you see other people being um, praised and awarded and, you know, I, I, I mean, it's happened in numbers at times, but it's okay. That is okay. Just say it, right? Like this goes back to the vulnerability. I Just couldn't say, agree more. Hey, I'm super jealous. And that's, we did have that conversation. I had it happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I was at a Kennedy Center Awards and there was, they were doing, it was, um, they were awarding an uh, international woman. And I remember sitting there thinking, and like, Hillary Clinton was there and Ann Curry was there. There are a whole bunch of people that were speaking. And I was so tired. I was so dead tired. And our organization was a partner for this. And so I had a seat in the audience just buried somewhere. And I remember just being like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. And I should be getting an award. It's all I was thinking. I'm like, I should get the award. And then they introduce the woman and they tell her story. Oh my gosh, Dr. Hawa Abdi, I'll never forget it. She is my shero of all time. She was in, ended up being nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. She had created in Somalia a community that ended up growing to 80,000 refugees just coming to her house and her welcoming them in. And they created a hospital and a school and all these different things. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe I don't deserve an award. Right. But it's okay. Like to laugh at yourself too. You know, it's, it's totally fine. There, there are amazing people doing incredible things. That is their path. That is their story. You own your story. You own where you are and what you're supposed to be doing. For me, it's a relationship between me and God. God, what do you want me to do today? Who do you want me to talk to? Where do you want me to put my feet? And, and let's go. Right. So like I go in partnership with the Lord and um, that is there's nothing better. There's no greater joy in the world than to like fulfill your life purpose. I have a question that was sent to me on the phone. Why do we feel or why? Yeah. Why do we feel what do you feel causes the jealousy within women? Why do we find it necessary to measure up to other women and essentially compete? Because most men don't do that like we do. Teresa? Oh, you know, it's human nature to begin with. I mean, it's, you know, um, Lindsay talks about the emotion and, and you know, I recently had um, wrote a book and it specifically talks about the two emotions, fear and greed, and how that drives us and our decision making. And what I talk about is own it. If you're jealous, you're jealous, but it can be a positive jealous. It can be a jealous that motivates you, but it kind of goes back to what I just said. If, if we independently celebrate women for accomplishing things that so many other women are accomplishing as if it's this magical moment, right? Like this is the first and only woman that's accomplished this. When we know there's probably a thousand other stories of women that are equal just as good or on their way in the same path. 
but we all crave that spotlight. And so we all want to crave to be that one instead of just being collective. And so I think society puts that on us. Um, one of my favorite things, um, you know, I don't get into Hollywood too much, but one of my favorite things is, is the, don't ask me what I'm wearing. Don't ask me to show you my manicure. Yeah, you know, don't ask me how much my dress or my purse or my shoes cost because you're not asking men that. And, and so at the end of the day, we don't want to, you know, the social media and the media makes us compete against each other. Are you sexy enough? Are you beautiful enough? Are you successful enough? And we, we celebrate it individually and celebrating it collectively. And I think sometimes that, that gets to us mentally but that's where you have to read, um, you have to network, you have to connect, and you have to you have to know who you are and be comfortable in your skin. And then once you do that, you'll feel a little bit more comfortable with not competing. It doesn't mean those emotions are going to go away. Emotions are emotions. There are times that I'm locked and I'm like, God, I wish I could be that woman, you know. But then I hear other people talk about me, and I'm like, I'm not worthy, <laughs> you know. So, you know, it's it's a constant, it's an evolution, but it's just recognizing it identifying it, calling it out and owning it is where we're going to start. It will not go away. Women will always compete with women and women will always compete with men. We're competitive at the end of the day. And that's what drives us. And that's what will make our story special. What the world needs now is, Teresa, you know this, Um, I don't know. <laughs> what does the world need now? Leadership. So it's part of. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my God, it's so bad. <laughs> You're right. It's late. It's like 730 where I'm at. So no, the, what the world needs now is leadership. Absolutely. Yeah. It needs um, somebody that's showing the way, laying the path down and, and having the right conversation. So Thank you, Andrea, for reminding me who I am. <laughs> you wrote a book, Care. I know, I wrote a book about it. So. Let's talk yeah. about that. What can you tell me about that book for people who don't know what that is? And it's an acronym. Uh, yeah, so the, um, the, the title of the book is um, Care, C-A-R-E, um, The Effective um, Control of Emotions. Um, you know, Leadership Through the Effective Control of Emotions. And I talk about the two emotions, fear and greed. Um, and then I talk about the four characteristics of a leader, which is um, confidence, authenticity, responsibility, and empathy. And that spares, spells out the word, uh, word care. So at the end of the day, if we just care about other people, it's very simple to remember that we all need to be human. Um, but I tell four very specific stories um, that are personal and then a couple of them that are law enforcement related that people would normally not hear the details of and, and how that shaped me to become a better person and a better leader to where um, when I meet other people, I walk away from that conversation and relationship feeling like I've left them inspired and, and left with a spark. So um, it's a passion project, but it came from NABO. Uh, we talked about being a part of volunteer boards, how so hard it is to be a part of volunteer boards because you have so many different opinions. And if you're an entrepreneur and you're on a board, you have a bunch of alphas you have a bunch of alpha women, right? I mean, yep. communication <laughs> is not always the best. <laughs> and, and we all are competing against each other. And so um, during my time as chair, we would go to chapter and chapter that were having challenges. And it was all about leadership and communication. And at the end of the day, the women just wanted to be heard. And so the more that we listened to them, the better the chapters responded. And, um, and I developed a talk on leadership and care. And then for three years, everybody kept saying, you got to write a book, you got to write a book. And so one of my passion projects when I sold my company was um, to finish that book. And so I did that this year. I'm very happy to do that. Uh, we have someone, Tina Fowler, she's in the audience. And she's, um, she, when I introduced her to you and to the book, She's like, I'm getting that book. So I don't know if she did or not. <laughs> so, but she was just like all gung ho for it. And she's from the Vallejo Chamber. So Lindsay, I want to go back to you. And Ladies America, how, tell me how that journey started and where you're at with that. And what is it and how does it help women? 
Right. So um, as I mentioned, I was working in politics. It was new to me. And I just, I, I truly felt like the only place where I just wasn't succeeding was in the relationships 